Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. This is the MIT Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition for July 24th, 2015. I'm Wade Rausch. I'm Outreach Officer at the Knight Science Journalism Program at MIT and a fellow MIT alum, and I'll be moderating our panel today. Now, to ask questions, simply fill in the form at the bottom of the screen. We will see your questions coming in, and we'll get to as many of them as we can today. And um, if you don't, if we don't get a chance to ask your question, we'll save those questions and forward them on to the uh, to the guests later. Now, you can also tweet during the event using hashtag MIT alum to let the outside world know what's going on. And uh, we hope that uh, you enjoy the next 45 minutes or so. So thousands of MIT alumni work at research institutions around the world. And today we're going to talk with three of them who will share with us some of the behind the scenes intel on uh, the biology and biological engineering labs that they run at universities around the US. We're joined today by uh, three amazing people. So first we have Susan Forsberg, who is a professor of biological sciences at the University of Southern California. Susan uh, earned her PhD here at MIT in 1989. Second, we have Craig Forrest, who earned a master's and PhD here at MIT back in 2007. And he's now associate professor of bioengineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Third and not least, we have Bree Aldridge, an MIT PhD from 2008, who is an assistant professor of molecular biology and microbiology at Tufts University, just up the road from us here. So welcome to all three of you. Thanks so much for joining us. Good to be here. So I'd like to start by asking each of you in turn to tell us a little bit about your research and the scope of what you're doing in your labs at your universities. And I think I'll start in the same order that, uh, that I just introduced you. So I'd like to tap you, Susan, to talk first about your work on yeast and um, how you're studying uh, genome stability in a particular, a very particular species of yeast and not the one that we know about from the kitchen, right? Right. So um, my lab is interested in overall understanding the process of genome instability, and particularly how the cell maintains the integrity of the DNA during the process of DNA replication. And being good biologists and thus reductionists, the simplest system that we use for this is um, a type of yeast. It's called fission yeast. Its proper name is Schizosaccharomyces pombi. Pombi means beer in Swahili, and it's used to make a beer in East Africa, although uh, we've done the experiment, and we don't really recommend that. Um, so Pombi is a good system for this because its chromosomes are organized very similarly to human chromosomes, and it uses most of the same genes as humans to regulate the process of DNA replication. And when uh, DNA replication and the damage that can occur during replication due to intrinsic stress, like fragile sites of the genome, or DNA damage, can lead to long-standing changes in the DNA sequence uh, rearrangements, and this process of genome instability is a characteristic of cancer cells. So the primary barrier to malignant transformation is actually the process of maintaining integrity during replication and the proper uh, response to DNA damage and DNA damage repair. Yeast gives us a great, uh, simple organism to study this. We have lots of terrific genetic tools and increasingly really fun cell biology tools. So a hallmark of my lab is combining classical microbial genetics with state-of-the-art live cell uh, image analysis, looking at pedigrees and identifying subpopulations uh, that may be uh, uh, relevant to particular outcomes. So for example, recent work uh, that we've been looking at has a mutation that uh, affects the process of DNA replication, but for some reason the cells aren't able to recognize the problem and they continue dividing. And they generate these abnormal nuclear structures, and I'm going to go to a little screen share here and show you a movie of these dividing cells, see if we can get this going, modern technology. So what you see here is uh, a yeast cell. It's a rod-shaped organism. The membranes here are uh, outlined in green, and in pink here uh, is the histones with, uh, with the DNA. And if I uh, run this movie, you'll see that rather than dividing in a very orderly fashion, this cell looks like it's having problems. I'm just going to let the movie run uh, through, and then we'll go back and step through it and, and, uh, and look a little bit at what's happening. So if we take this uh, cell, it's going to try to divide here, and it's starting to divide. But then uh, it changes its mind. 
And now uh, it just puts the nucleus in one half, and the other daughter cell gets no DNA whatsoever. Uh -huh. And then a little further along, now it does divide again, but it divides in such a way that instead of having a nucleus in each daughter cell, it generates these extra nuclei, which are called micronuclei. And uh, some of them rejoin, and some of them stay separate. And, uh, and this could go on uh, multiple times. And why we're particularly interested in this uh, phenomenon is that micronuclei and... Um, Let's get back to my screen here. Micronuclei um, are associated with particular forms of genome rearrangements, and we have evidence that that's happening in yeast. And now we've got a great system to begin to study that. So that's just one example of how we're using the simple genetic system to look at uh, a medically relevant human health problem. Susan, could I ask just one follow-up question? Um, could you talk a little bit about the um, yeast that you chose? This is a specific species that isn't used all that often as a model organism in U.S. laboratories anyway, right? So talk a little bit about Pombi. Um, so I uh, went to work on Pombi when I did my postdoctoral work in England in the lab of a guy called uh, Paul Nurse. Um, and uh, he had developed this as um, a genetic system for looking at specific aspects of the cell cycle, um, uh, similar to work that had been done in the more familiar brewing yeast that um, other labs have used. And, uh, but Pombi has chromosomes that are much more similar to human chromosomes than the other yeast. A lot of the same tractable, tractable genetic tools, but it is um, it is a very different species. Yeast, as a term, is kind of like animal, and just as animal can apply to you and a fruit fly, these yeast are pretty different from one another. But this one's got great chromosomes that behave like human chromosomes and those same genes, so that's why we use it. Great. Okay, thanks for that introduction, and uh, we'll come back to you for a kind of a general discussion once uh, we've gone through all the introductions. Right. So um, I'm going to move on to Craig Forrest from Georgia Tech. Craig, you are a um, are you a biological engineering PhD? Is that your department? At MIT? Uh, mechanical, actually, mechanical. Mechanical engineering. Okay. Um, well, so you're working on micro robotics, um, and and um, one of the things you're up to at at Georgia Tech is um, helping undergraduates and grad students um, learn their way around um, a um, sort of a maker lab. So I'm, I'm really curious to hear, have you tell us about what's going on in your laboratory, but also maybe talk a little bit about your activities, um, building a culture of, of hands-on uh, experimentation and, and maker activity at Tech. Sure. At tech. Yeah. Sure. I'd be happy to mention just for a few minutes on each of those. Um, so I've been here at Georgia Tech for, uh, I think, eight years or so now. Uh, just got tenure last year, so that's good. I can't can't be fired anymore. Um, so um, my lab tries to build tools that can make biological measurements. And over the past couple of years, we've gotten sucked into uh, the Brain Initiative, which is a big federal push to understand how the brain works. Um, I've got a little picture here to show you to kind of illustrate how how hard this is. Uh, this is a, a little cartoon of the inside of the brain. And uh, the human brain has about 86 billion neurons. Each neuron is like a that central cell there you see with these little spindly things called dendrites coming off of it. And of these 86 billion neurons, they're connected in little circuits, and the circuits are connected in bigger networks, and we don't have any idea how many different types of cells there are, and we don't know how these individual circuits function. It's really very, very complicated, and so far that's prevented scientists and medical uh, doctors from solving uh, basic diseases of the brain. You know, we don't have any cures for Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or epilepsy or even even something as basic as a headache. Um, and so my, the hope is that you know we can develop some tools that allow us to measure um, inside of the living uh, brain and. One of the things we've done over the past um, couple of years is develop a robot that allows uh, a neuroscientist to uh, go into the living brain and record from record the electrical activity of an individual cell uh, in in the living brain while you while you perturb it. So, say you add a stimulus, whether a drug or maybe a behavioral stimulus, and you can record that neural activity while it's happening. So for uh, for a lot of neuroscientists, this is a really useful um, thing to be able to measure, and we've started a company that has sold these robots around the world now, and so that's been a lot of fun as well to sort of translate that research into the commercial sector. Um, 
And then just a little bit about the uh, the other half of my life here is sort of involved with the uh, maker uh, community. Um, what that means is there are a, a lot of students these days really want to do something that, while they're a student here, they want to do something where they can create something real from their their own idea and, and create a real working prototype of that idea that can have an impact on the world. So as opposed to just doing the homework problems where the answer is in the back of the book, students want to work on open-ended problems in, in teams where they solve a real problem in the world and then actually provide that solution to the customer. And so one of the things we've started here is a maker space and it's turned out into this huge, huge facility that is used by about a thousand students per month. Uh, it's run entirely by the students themselves. There's about a hundred students that run it. Uh, as I said, it's used by about a thousand students per month. They can build whatever they want in there for free. There's about a million dollars of capital equipment for uh, machining or, or printing uh, plastic and metal and wood and everything you might want to do. And it's really changing uh, engineering education uh, to be much more hands-on and uh, maker, creator, hacker, as opposed to sort of uh, filling your head with knowledge from a textbook. That's fantastic, Craig. So how much science did you have to learn? How much sort of biology and neuroscience um, did you have to study to, to do your work on um, instruments that can, can measure things like neural activity? Well, that's a good question. I think... Uh, you know, I never could have enough expertise as a neuroscientist to do that. And so while I did dabble in this in my postdoc um, at uh, Harvard Medical School, I mainly have relied on hiring experts. So we've hired research scientists who, who have neuroscience background. We've hired chemists. And they know a lot more than I do about what's, what's possible and what the science means. So when you're measuring, let's say, two neurons that are communicating with each other, and there are synaptic properties and intrinsic properties of these neurons. I mean, this is the finest grains of neuroscience that we really have to re either rely on our collaborators or rely on, on uh, research scientists that we can hire to be able to interpret that data and to determine if the tools are working. So I think it's, it's uh, important, maybe as a postdoc, to explore that side if you are an engineer and want to get into the bio side. But I think you can also hire or collaborate with people uh, in that area. Great. OK. Thanks so much for that introduction, Craig. And now we're going to move on to Bree. So Bree, um, fill us in about what's going on at Tufts. You're working on um, ways to engineer more effective therapies against tuberculosis, right? Right. right. So when I was at MIT, um, I was in the biological engineering department. And my background is in quantitative single cell biology. and. When I started my postdoc, I decided to bring sort of that mode of thinking over to infectious disease, and I became really fascinated with the subject of tuberculosis. So most people in the U.S. don't realize that tuberculosis is still a major problem. Um, it's the second leading cause of death in the world due to a single infectious agent. And we're really lacking in tools to tackle TB because it's really difficult to treat, and we don't have a vaccine. So even now, TB treatment lasts at least six months and involves at least four drugs. It's a really, really long time to be on antibiotics. So what my lab is trying to do is understand what is different about the bacteria that die at the early stages of the drug therapy period from the bacteria that are killed at the end of the period so that we can try and target those really hard to, to kill cells. Um, so let me um, bring up some of my slides so I can sort of show you guys what I'm talking about. And just sort of, can you guys see my slides now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so um, my lab uses quantitative single cell biology and mathematical modeling um, to try and understand not only what's happening in single mycobacteria, those are the causative agents of tuberculosis, and the host cells, the host macrophages that they infect. And, and so what we do is we look at three different kinds of questions. The first question we ask is, how does tuberculosis itself tolerate stress? Um, we also try and understand how that ability to tolerate stress of the bacteria is altered when they are in the host cell environment. And finally, how the bacteria themselves alter their host environment. So, 
some of my lab works on just the bacteria alone, and some of my lab works in infected macrophages. Um, and to do this, we all do a lot of live cell imaging in the lab. So um, one of the big questions we have, the simplest question that we ask, which sounds really obvious but still remains unanswered, is what is the difference between bacteria that are killed quickly with antibiotics and bacteria that take a long time to be killed? So that's what we're trying to understand in the lab using single cell approaches. So to do this, we developed a, a microfluidic device. Oh, 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 I'm screen sharing, so I can't show you the device right now. But um, you can see, I'll play this little movie. These are two sister mycobacterium cells, um, and they have a chromosome label. And what I want you guys to notice when you watch these cells grow in the microfluidic device is that the cells do not divide in the middle and the cells are growing at very different rates. So this is the parent when we, anyone who works with mycobacteria will tell you that they're extremely variable cells and we don't understand why. And when we started to watch these cells grow, what became apparent to us is that they had extremely different growth properties from each other. So what we learned next was we did a pulse chase experiment. And what that means is we took a fluorescent dye and we tossed it on the outside of the cells, removed it, and then watched to see where the cells were putting down new cell wall. And what you could see when we did that, so the green is the old cell wall and the red is the new cell wall. You can see that these cells are growing asymmetrically. I don't know if that's showing up very well over the hangout. Um, yeah, we can see that, Bree. That's working. Okay, good. Um, so it was, it was one of those really cool aha moments in science where you're sitting at the microscope and you leave the microscope and grab anybody that you can from the hallway to come look at your movie because it was <laughs> um, so stunning. Um, so what we see again is that the mycobacteria are growing from only one side. And so what that means is that the cell inheriting the growth pole from the mom has a different growth property from the um, cell inheriting the non-growing pole. And what we found using this microfluidic device system is that the cells have different growth properties and antibiotic susceptibilities. So what we're doing in the lab now is essentially using this system to engineer improved drug regimens. We're trying to characterize as many parameters as we can of cells that behave differently under drug stress. Um, and we use mathematical modeling to see if we can predict how to target those particular subpopulations. So, Bree, just a quick follow-up on that. So, would that entail developing multiple drugs to hit different sort of sub-strains of tuberculosis, or are you talking about figuring out um, from the vulnerabilities? Um, you can't you can't manipulate the tuberculosis population, right? You can only change the drugs you're using. Right, and there's a lot of development of new drugs right now, but as I think as many people know, it's really difficult to design new antibiotics. Um, what we're trying to see is whether there's a way we can use the drugs in a different way. So maybe instead of giving the same four pills every three days, if there's a way that you can do a high dose of certain combination of those drugs, target those particular bacteria that are taking so long to be killed. That's what we're trying to understand. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, those are terrific introductions, so thanks, everyone. I wanted to put a common question to the three of you and see if we could get a group discussion going. And then we'll open it up for a conversation uh, using questions coming in from our viewers. So um, it seems like a pretty exciting time to be a biologist. And I just wanted to ask each of you to maybe weigh in on that. Um, I think uh, especially around, um, around here in, in Cambridge, um, there is excitement about the new CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing, uh, gene editing system. And everyone's trying to figure out what that means for um, sort of the democratization of, um, of uh, genome editing uh, capabilities. Um, and uh, I know that that doesn't necessarily uh, become uh, instantly useful to everyone as a, uh, who's researching biology. but. Um, that's the kind of uh, breakthrough that feels like it's happening more and more often these days. And I, I wanted to ask each of you to maybe say why this is a good time to be a biologist and what makes you excited to, to be in your particular field right now. 
And I, I know, Craig, that uh, that uh, you're in mechanical engineering, but um, you know you're probably benefiting from these things as well indirectly. So maybe I could ask Susan to start first. Sure, happy to. The um, you know Cas the Cas9 CRISPR system coming on top of I think the big revolution when I was just leaving graduate school was PCR, and I'm a very old molecular biologist, and that was a revolutionary technology uh, as well. Um, and then, of course, all the genomic level uh, stuff that we have. And I think Bree would agree with me that we're really living in a, a, a golden age of the resurgence of light microscopy. So that technology is, is becoming uh, incredibly important. Uh, with Cas9 CRISPR is um, taking some of the advantages that those of us in model systems have always enjoyed in being able to you know, make and, and manipulate genomes very easily. And now that's bringing those sorts of abilities for working in, in more complex systems. Um, with the complete genome sequence of so many organisms and the genomic level of systems, I think we're able to find patterns of, of, of conserved modules and how they're plugged in in different ways according to different needs. It's really quite exciting. So there's a convergence of tools, and uh, it's one of the reasons it's kind of so frustrating with the funding issue the way it is because the, the horizon is limitless and we're um, only limited by what we're willing to put into it. Bree, um, can you pick up on that that comment about light microscopy? And uh, and do you do any um, uh, editing stuff in your lab? So you we're not doing any editing stuff um, right now. What we're doing is putting reporters into macrophages instead. Um, but you know, picking up on the light microscopy idea, I, I definitely agree. I think one of the things that's most exciting to me about being in biology right now is that we can take all of these new technologies and use them to understand pathogens in a way that we used to only try and understand model systems before. So for the first time, we're able to really say, what's happening in the system? You know, in the case of mycobacteria, there's a joke in the field that we always assume it acts like E. coli until proven otherwise. And now that we actually start looking at these cells, we see that they actually don't really act like E. coli at all. And the differences between E. coli and mycobacteria are huge and fundamental and, and I think are really going to change how we go about treating this disease. Um, and so I think it's fun to think about how can we use these new technologies to understand systems that we've never been able to probe before and use that to actually push the technology and take that back to the model systems to understand a lot more about the fundamentals of biology. Craig, maybe one of the um, most exciting developments in, in neuroscience um, lately has been um, optogenetics, which gives you the ability to actually manipulate uh, cells at, at, the, uh, at the level of individual neurons and using light. So I don't know um, if that's um, something that you guys have incorporated into your lab, but it's certainly it's generating the same kinds of excitement in, in the neuroscience world that something like CRISPR is uh, in the molecular biology world. So what makes you kind of excited right now? Yeah. Um so I think in general, you know, it is a it is a gold rush right now that, you know, maybe very loosely saying, you know, the ele electronics era, you know, of, of the of the, let's say of the 80s and then the nanotechnology era of the 90s and now and now we're sort of in this biology or genomics or neuro era, and the gold rush is that engineers are coming in with the ability to uh, manipulate or measure. Uh, living things at at the molecular or cellular scale, you know, in the case of gene editing or or triggering action potentials in neurons, and that that is a real revolution. Uh, and so, um, it's a very exciting time, and I think for engineers to be able to have a real impact on human health is is very exciting. I mean, here in you know, the bioengineering departments have sprouted up around the country. And they're drawing um, uh, students from different backgrounds. For example, you know the biomedical engineering department here is 50% women, and whereas most engineering departments are about 20% women. So there's a real, a real uh, excitement about about the um, people that are coming in to solve these problems and really um, impact society. Um, so, you know, and then as far as the NIH goes. Uh, you know the, the the pay line is low. It's I don't know eight or ten percent the the percentage of grants that get funded. But at the same time, the amount of money that the federal government is committing to uh, uh, benefit research to benefit human health is l much larger than sort of traditional engineering disciplines. So say if you're competing for an NSF grant for two hundred thousand, 
you could maybe put that same effort into an NIH grant, and if you get it, then it would be ten times more, maybe two million. So, so there's a lot more you can do with that kind of money in terms of, uh, you know, really beating a problem into submission. So, um, so I think that's part of the the deal. You know, so at Georgia Tech, for example, uh, twenty years ago, um, there was virtually zero NIH funding, and today. Uh, there's about 50 million in NIH funding at Georgia Tech. And we are building, I mean, right out my window here is a brand new building, a uh, $100 million building that is dedicated to bringing in NIH money, a brand new building. So these departments are growing uh, disproportionately compared to, you know, civil and mechanical and aero uh, to go after this kind of uh, private and public funding and really. Um, you know, align with hospitals and align with, um, uh, you know, institutions that can translate that research into uh, human health benefits. Okay, great. Those are all great points. Thanks, Craig. We do have a question coming in, and I want to remind our viewers that, that everybody can submit questions to us using the, uh, the comment form field at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to pass along a question from Bruce in Boston. I think this is a question for Bree. Um, will pulling drugs off of shelves make enough of an impact on the TB strains that are out there, as Nova suggested this week? So apparently there was an episode of Nova talking about uh, tuberculosis treatments and the idea of uh, cutting cutting down on the number of types of drugs we're throwing at the the problem. So does that ring a bell, Bree? Um, so I haven't. Um, I've actually been traveling, so I haven't um, caught up on all my PBS viewing <laughs> lately. But um, the idea of going a you know, cutting the number of drugs we use for TB is not something that is really being discussed right now. I actually just returned from a meeting on TB drug development and discovery. And the problem with TB is it's so hard to kill um, that if we use fewer drugs, you increase the chance that an individual will have drug resistance, right? So if we just think about numbers and the frequency of um, spontaneous mutations, in the genome, when an individual presents with TB, they have such a high bacterial burden that by pure numbers, they're likely to already have monodrug resistance. Right? So if we cut the drugs, it's likely that even if the, that patient takes their drugs the way they should and are compliant, um, that they're going to have drug resistance. So I'm afraid that if we cut the number of drugs we use, um, we're going to see more difficulty with drug resistance. That being said, there's a lot of discussion these days about how can we activate TB or how do we drug the host in a way to change the immune system so that we can kill all of the bacteria. That's being discussed as a way that we can speed up drug therapy. Okay, great. So a lot of new questions being asked about that. Okay, I have another question coming in from uh, Pratika in Cambridge. And the question is, um, which will have a bigger funding, a, a bigger impact on uh, cancer research, tuberculosis research, or neuroscience research in the years to come, government funding or venture capital funding? So that's a little bit provocative. I mean, uh, VC hasn't t typically played a gigantic role in fundamental research, but uh, I mean, that usually is, comes in at the stage when uh, uh, discovery is being translated to the market. But I mean, maybe there's room for private funding of certain kinds of research. Does that? Does anybody want to jump in on that one? Well, I mean, I think there's always room for it. Uh, the problem is, is that private funding tends to want an outcome and a product, and basic research isn't. A, it's it's a grant, not a contract. It's you know, let me explore this. The analogy I like to use is basic researchers are exploring a cave with torches, and part of our job is figuring out that this tunnel doesn't go anywhere. And the applied researchers may be coming along with the arc lights, and they're gonna they're gonna pull out the product. But, you know, explaining to somebody that letting me study the process of basic biology and yeast um, that, you know, we're going to impact cures and outcomes in 20 years, but not tomorrow. Uh, and private money tends to want a return faster than that. And I also think, you know, just thinking about what the NIH is doing, the NIH is starting to pull away from only using R01s and R21s to primarily fund labs. There, you know, the director has been talking about increasing funds to the high risk, high reward projects, which are the, you know, the pioneer awards and the new innovator awards and the early independence awards. Um, and what's nice about that funding stream is it's the opposite of, you know, as Susan said, what venture capital wants or what these project-oriented 
funds are, and it's open-ended funding that are meant to reward people that are creative and have a history of being productive with their research so that they get a pot of money and they can do what they want to do and discover something that they don't necessarily already have preliminary data for. Mm -hmm. Craig, do you think the, um, the uh, engineering world has anything to, to teach the biology world in this respect? I know that your maker lab at Georgia Tech has uh, quite a few uh, industrial sponsors, right? Yeah, um, I mean, as far as research, I think there are some private. <clears throat> there's emerging. There are some private foundations that are emerging as, as you know, at least in neuroscience, as as powerhouses like the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle or Janalia Farms uh, in Virginia, which is a Howard Hughes Institute. Um, so you know, if a if a promising neuroscientist is thinking about okay, should I go into academia or, or should I go to work for one of these private foundations? Um, you know, you have some different, different trade-offs there. But I think if you're looking to advance your academic research, you know, venture capital would probably not be at the top of my list uh, unless you had maybe a startup company coming out. Again, you'd have to have some, you know, return on investment in, you know, n number of years where n is less than 10 or something, and that wouldn't be guaranteed in a, an academic lab. Um, you know, as far as the invention studio and catalyzing engineering inventions at universities, um, sorry, the, I forgot to mention earlier, the facility that I, that I described earlier is called the invention studio, and the arrangement we've made there is that companies, um, are each donating ten thousand dollars per semester to be a part of that place and that's how we run it it's not funded by tuition or state money and uh, th those companies are eager to participate because they want to hire students who can build stuff and so um, they get their logo on the wall and they get to have a, a project that the students tinker with and so in that way um, uh, you know, they're able to find new talent. I mean, uh, Georgia Tech ha has a history of being a kind of blue-collar, lunchbox kind of engineering school where big companies like John Deere and Google and Exxon want to really, really want to hire our graduates. And so they're clamoring for the attention of these graduating seniors. And so this is a way that we can channel, we can connect, you know, connect the seniors who need jobs with the companies that want to hire them. You know, in, in, in addition to the opportunities with whether it's graduate school or, you know, starting their own company, we want to make sure we make sure these big employers get, get access to our graduates and make them an attractive offer as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, uh, actually, that, that brings to mind a related question that I, I like to put to Bree and Susan. So, how well do you feel that your departments um, uh, provide uh, grooming or training or advice to, to, to grad students who might enjoy a career in industry? Um, I mean, basically, uh, most academic biology departments are, are set up to create more academic biologists, right? What if a person wants to take a job at a pharmaceutical or biotech company? Do, are there resources in your departments for those kinds of folks? Absolutely. And in fact, we have, uh, a ver I mean, very few of my students have gone, in, gone into academia, most have gone into industry. Um, and uh, we have an active program where we bring in um, graduate alumni who are in a variety of, of uh, I'm not going to say alternative careers because I don't think they are alternative. They're perfectly valid careers. But in non-academic careers, uh, in biotech and policy and science writing and so on, and they come back and, um, uh, and talk to our current students and give them kind of ideas and resources. Um, the professional societies are also um, doing a really good job at doing that kind of outreach. So we take it very seriously that, that we want to make sure our students have a, um, a range of experiences. Um, one of my students uh, uh, last year did a program that the uh, Society for Cell Biology runs called the, uh, at the Keck Graduate Institute uh, in Southern California, which is a two-week business boot camp, you know, biotech boot camp. How does it work? How do ideas, what's, how do the processes work? And they sort of had a little mini semi-MBA experience for the summer, and it got picked up by KGI and industry and ASCB funded. So those sorts of things are available and encouraged. What about a tough spree? At Tufts, yeah, definitely. We don't assume that all students are going into academics. Um, we all know that that's not really the, the case right now. And uh, actually it's built into our mentoring system now, where starting in you know, the second year after, with your second committee meeting, we, the committees always ask the students, you know, what is your career plan? There's a written form that they need to fill out, and it's discussed annually. 
to try and make sure that we are meeting educationally the goals of what the students want in terms of what they want to do later. Um, it sounds like just like at USC and probably a lot of other schools, Tufts has a very strong um, graduate student council that works together um, and we have alumni panels that come in to talk about different job options and, and try and help students network to find these jobs. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Going back to the academic track, though, we have a question coming in from Eric in Seattle who observes that the number of faculty haven't changed at most schools in a long time. Um, if you look at the absolute number of uh, tenure track books, but the number of research scientists may have tripled or quadrupled. So the question is, which of your institutions is addressing the growing divide between tenured faculty and uh, PIs, research scientists, postdoctoral fellows, better? I guess it's <laughs> competition. Who's doing this best? <laughs> Uh, let's see, I guess I'll take a, a crack at this one. I mean, if you think about a tenured faculty position from a university president's point of view, it's a huge commitment. I mean, you're basically hiring someone for, you know, 30, 40 years, and you can't fire them after a certain period of time. So, like, for example, in the 90s, uh, there was a ton of hiring in electrical engineering departments across the country. Georgia Tech has 120 electrical engineering faculty. Okay, that's like the biggest department in the country. But the number of undergraduates is half of the mechanical engineering department. So they're all lopsided, right? They're paying all these faculty salaries, but they only have half the number of undergraduates as the mechanical engineering department. So um, it's not a flexible system at all. So if I was a university president, I would say, how can I have a more uh, agile workforce here? How can I um, bring in adjuncts and research scientists to respond to um, research opportunities or teaching opportunities in a, in a more flexible way. So, um, you know, I don't know how this is going to play out in the long term. Personally, I think if you're, if you're a faculty member with a strong research program, you don't have anything to worry about. Uh, whether, let's say it was a five-year contract. Let's say I was on a five-year contract that was renewed with no tenure. Well, if you're at the top of your game, it's not a problem. It's only those, uh, you know, uh, difficult tenure, you know, cases where the, that 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 would be concerned in that situation. So, I guess I would say, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of frustration in universities where you where you carry along that the tenure pro process has downsides as well. That's all. Yeah, good point. Um, what about USC or or Tufts? Um, is there Frustration about the um, the lack of uh, mobility between the sort of uh, PI uh, associate postdoc level and the tenured level. Um, well, we have. I mean, a lot of that is seen at um, medical research institutes. You know, the soft money research institutes and medical schools that tend to be soft money that have you know an increased number of uh, NTT faculty. Um, SC takes pride in making sure that its um, its undergraduates are taught by tenure track faculty. So we don't have a big component of that on the undergraduate campus, which is where I am. Uh, but I'm sure that there's uh, some of that at the medical school. But I think what this is is a consequence of this pyramid scheme, right? Universities have an expect ever increasing expectation for the number of grants their faculty bring in. That means their faculty need people to do that work. That means we have in burgeoning numbers of graduate students and postdocs. And like any pyramid scheme, those at the top are doing well and have really no incentive to change it. And those further down uh, uh, down have a large incentive to change it. And you know, a lot of the professional societies are really starting to look into this. And there have been uh, editorials in science and so on talking about how do we um, structure a sustainable biomedical uh, 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 workforce um, that may not be uh, it may not be the model that was built in the expansionist years of the 70s and you know how do we how do we make those adjustments and it, the problem is the adjustments have to be made at all levels of that pyramid not just uh, at the bottom levels but also for those who are uh, deeply uh, successful in the current status quo. All right, so we have a question coming in from an MIT alum, uh, Bill in San Diego. This is sort of a general question about medicine, I guess, or um, how medicine is uh, administered. So Bill asks, in general, I'm hesitant to use any drug, uh, not so much because I don't see their value, but because I always look for natural alternates first. Can you comment on the possibility of putting more emphasis on alternative treatments and how you're, you're incorporating that into your work, if at all? 
that's kind of a left field question, but uh, I mean, uh, obviously biologists think first about creating um, active treatments, drugs, right, devices. And now, I'm say that, you know, I'm a very reductionist biologist. I'm, I'm so far away from looking at uh, translational. I am looking at fundamental biological processes. And my expectation is that understanding those fundamental biological processes will identify um, possible uh, interventions and outcomes. But I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not looking at a product. I'm looking at a process. Right. Bree, I, probably people, doctors who treat tuberculosis um, might look askance at homeopathy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think there's, you know, there is some attention to how holistic health changes your susceptibility to TB. For example, vitamin D, the more vitamin D can improve your immune system in a way that can help fight TB. And um, they're starting, there's some labs that are starting to elucidate the molecular mechanisms for that. Um, so if you consider that alternative medicine or a more natural or holistic approach, there are definitely things that can be done to improve the health of the patient and to help their immune system fight back against TB. Um, but I think when we're talking about an infection like TB, some of the alternative medicines or, or natural um, antibacterials are really not going to scratch the surface, like coconut oil or tea tree oil, those things aren't going to help penetrate the lungs and kill TB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so... I wanna, if I can dive in here, I think there's something that, that this may get at. It kind of relates to some of the things that Bree's bringing up, and that's that uh, probably in the last five years we've become suddenly aware of our microbiome, you know, the microorganisms that make up part of our metabolism and how they impact our health. And some of the sorts of products and, and things that Bree was talking about, maybe things that are interacting with the, uh, with the uh, microflora that are a natural part of our body. Right. Well, that's a whole sort of cosmology we're just starting to explore. So yeah, it really raises the complication level. Um, I wanted to put a final question to the whole panel and, um, and maybe then we can wrap up. It's about what worries you? What keeps you up at night? Um, I guess, uh, are there things that, um, is, there, is there a big headache that you see that could get in the way of further progress in your field? Um, and if, if there's like one thing that you could wave your magic wand and solve, what would it be? The thing you worry most about? Preventing I'm progress in your my people funded. Keeping um, your people funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got people who have families and you know, um, I'm down a grant right now and I worry about that, you know, because I let them go, you know, I, that keeps me up at night. Are you optimistic, pessimistic? Pessimistic right now. Because of the direction the government funding is going in? Right. Yeah. And I really am glad that, you know, I'm in my 50s and not starting out. <laughs> That's a pretty sad commentary. <laughs> Uh, Bree, what, what keeps you up at night? Well, I, you know, I think Susan echoes a lot of, of what we worry about, and I'm, you know, I'm a brand new professor, and when I went on the job market, I had professors straight up ask me wh why I was going into academics given the current funding environment. What's happening in this environment is that we're losing enti an entire generation of scientists, and this is a generation of scientists that is extremely multidisciplinary and I think has a lot of the new tools coming in that we really need to, to start to make more progress on a lot of diseases. And so it's sad. And I hear people tell me that, you know, students and postdocs in, in my department will tell me that they're worried about their futures in science because of lack of funding. And, you know, as, as far as keeping my own lab going, I'm just sort of, you know, I've been, I've been very lucky with my funding so far, and I'm just trying to make the most of it um, so we can keep ourselves going and hopefully get through this, this funding bump. Okay, Craig, um, what's your the biggest problem weighing on you right now? Well, let's take a little bit of a different tack here. Um, as far as neuroscience goes, um, there was a paper not too long ago that used uh, the following analogy to describe our understanding of the brain. Our ability to measure what's happening inside of the brain right now is like watching a television program, but you can only see one pixel of the TV. Okay, so we can only record from one or maybe a few neurons in a living brain at once. And so we are so far away from being able to understand how this computer works um, that my worry is that despite our best efforts and 
these millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are being thrown at this problem right now, and entire generations of neuroscientists are uh, are going to be weaned on this this brain initiative challenge. Um, I'm afraid that uh, the problem is just not very. Uh, <laughs> it's ex incredibly complicated, and uh, I hope we can make a dent in it. I hope I can. Um, contribute to that and, and live to see uh, us make a dent in this problem. But I worry it's uh, beyond our ability to understand uh, for a long time. All right, so we're almost out of time, but I, I realize that it's it's really bad form, actually, for me to end the whole session on such a downer of a question. <laughs> so, you know, uh, let's go back one for one more round. I'd like you to each quickly, let's have a lightning round and talk about what makes you optimistic. I mean, we have a very difficult century ahead of us. Clearly, we're going to have to deal with lots of changes. Uh, climate, we have uh, pop population diseases, aging, uh, demographic change, um, and medicine and biology and bioengineering are going to be absolutely central to to solving those, dealing with those problems. So maybe uh, you could each give me a, you know, in a couple of sentences a reason why um, you're, you're, you, know, you love doing what you do because you know, you're convinced that it's going to actually help. I can start there. Um, so I love what I do, and I love bringing mathematics and quantitation to biology because I think, you know, we've learned a lot from reducing biology down to single factors and single outcomes, but just like, you know, with Craig's analogy of looking at a single pixel at a time, we need to start also bringing that together into a more holistic view of what's happening with the complexity of different cells and, and, and with whole whole hosts in, in my case. Um, and, and so I think the idea that we are starting to bring more quanti quantification and computation into our education of biologists and back into the lab, I think gives me a lot of optimism that we are going to be able to, to take biology to the next step. And I also think the current age of, of the internet and things like this, Google Hangout is helping to bring communication of science to the general public. Um, and, and I'm hoping that we'll help ignite curiosity in the public and also bring a more um, data-based perspective to politics. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you there, Bree. How about Craig? I'll go to you next and, and uh, ask you what makes you optimistic. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm optimistic that that science and engineering is, is, is in the public lexicon and that uh, it's becoming cool. That you know, if you go to science, if you go to India and China and ask kids what they be, what they want to be when they grow up, uh, it's it's something like sixty percent that say they want to be scientists and engineers. Here in the U.S., it's much much lower. You're much more likely to get an answer like LeBron James or or Rihanna. You know, so these kids want to be celebrities. So so I think we, I'm optimistic that we can make engineers and scientists into celebrities. That, that whether it's the internet or whether it's you know all this technology in your iPhone or you know kids coming around saying I want to I want to be a tinkerer I want to build stuff the maker revolution they want to change the world and 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 the student energy here at Georgia Tech is just it's really palpable and it's really invigorating and so I'm excited to kind of ride that wave and uh, you know I, I like the heroes we have in our um, you know like whether it's a Dean Kamen or a, or an Elon Musk that's that's making gadgets cool, and, and more kids are getting inspired, kind of like the, the NASA Apollo missions of the 70s again. So I would say I'm inspired by uh, human ingenuity, and uh, my undergraduates just knock my socks off. Uh, I, it, they inspire me because with the energy they have and the ideas they have and a sense of that they, they, they feel that they can potentially change the world, and that, that inspires me a lot. That sounds like an old farts response, but I really do feel that way. Um, and I think this ingenuity, and, and as I said, the golden age of, tech, of some technologies have just uh, democratized science and made it available uh, to so many people, and um, uh, so many more people can participate in it. That inspires me, too. All right, fantastic. We had a little bit of a Google glitch there at the very end, but thanks so much, uh, Susan and, and Craig and Bree. Uh, thank you for joining us. This has been really terrific. And um, I wanted to say on behalf of the MIT Alumni Association and the Knight Science Journalism Program, uh, thanks for tuning in to this Faculty Forum Online Alumni Edition. And uh, keep an eye on the MIT Alumni Association website for news about the next time we're going to do this. This was fun. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Signing off. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.